Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Normally, the sessions after lunch are slightly difficult to handle, <laughs> to keep people ever to keep uh, everybody interested and engaged. So, uh, is there anybody in the room who does not know about the coronation of the king in London today? <laughs> right. So, uh, everybody has uh, heard of you know the coronation. So, um, and I thought this is an interesting time, uh, interesting day to do this session uh, because. I was thinking of the couple of hundred years of Indian history, which are closely related to this event. And uh, in May of 1857, something very, very important and exciting was happening in India. The first war of Indian independence. And then there's a story of an old king. Strangely, it so happens there is an old king today in London as well. So, uh, uh, results. So this book is like a magical Persian carpet so, uh, with so many uh, vibrant uh, colors and nuances and so many threads. So there is this large story of the uh, Indian uh, War of Independence and then the decline of the Mughal Empire at the same time and then mellifluous Urdu poetry. And in the middle of it all is the greatest Urdu poet of all, Mirza Ghalib. So this is the story of murder at Mushaira. And uh, I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to moderate this session uh, with my idol and uh, one of my favorite authors, Mir Ali Raza. So to begin with, uh, Raza, it would help the audience to lay out this grand story with so many, uh, as I said, uh, intricacies and then a murder mystery uh, in the backdrop of the first war of independence. Uh, thank you, Krishna, and uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, making it out here. Uh, 1857 uh, is a very important moment in world history. Uh, one could argue that it is arguably one of the most important events in world history in the 19th century. Uh, because what really happened there was that a few things happened. First is that a bunch of, you know, ragtag revolutionaries took on the greatest superpower of their time and almost won. Uh, so it was, a, it, it was a war of very unmatched forces, but yet it was fought with a lot of passion. And it may well have laid the foundations of Indian independence, which was to follow 90 years later in 1947. Uh, it was very perceptive of you to link it to events today. Uh, you know, there is a coronation, uh, there is a leader in, in UK of uh, Indian origin. But uh, my book picks up the story uh, right before the uh, events of 1857 were unfolding there was a moment of great intrigue and suspense in Delhi about something that was imminent. And uh, both the British and the Indians were not very clear what was happening. And so what my book does is that it takes a murder mystery and sets it right in that fateful week, which is, by the way, this week, you know, uh, the rebels uh, took over the Red Fort of New Delhi on the 10th of, on the morning of the 11th of May, uh, 1857. So uh, using those events as, uh, you know, backdrop, it investigates a murder mystery. And like uh, you were saying, Krishna, uh, the central character, Mirza Ghalib, is of course a much beloved poet uh, throughout uh, uh, the Urdu landscape and also has taken on the dimensions of a global poet. So putting him right there uh, and making him a detective added a lot of texture to my plot. And thanks, Raza. And uh, people may not have, uh, people have heard of Ghalib. A lot of people try to understand Urdu poetry, but it might help the audience if you lay out the timeline of Ghalib as well and introduce the person behind the poem, the poet. Sure, sure. Uh, 
you know, uh, most of us are familiar with many of Ghalib's couplets, uh, some of them spoken in praise of himself, uh, most notably ke hai aur bhi dunya mein sukhanwar bohat achhe, kehte hain ke Ghalib ka hai andaze bayan aur. Uh, Mirza Ghalib, Mirza Ghalib is a very interesting character for a bunch of reasons. One is that he, he straddled a great transformation in Indian society. What do I mean by that? Uh, Ghalib was born at the turn of the 19th century, around 1797, and he died in 1870. He was born, therefore, in Mughal India, and he died in British India. 1857 marks the moment where the British crown formally took over the administration of India after the uh, failure of the 1857 mutiny and then India became a full-fledged colony. So Ghalib was witness to one of this, this great transformation. But this is the more dramatic political transformation. But there were also economic transformations going on, technological transformations going on, and social transformations going on. For example, the post and telegraph system was being instituted in India. And Ghalib used that to write to start writing letters. So Ghalib is very well known to many of us as a poet, and his poems were very formal. But he was also a prose writer, and his prose, uh, basically collected through his letters and published during his lifetime, are written in a very simple, accessible style, and give you a lot of information about uh, transformations that were happening in the 19th century. Ghalib was also becoming familiar with the legal system of India that was being transformed. He was fighting court cases. So in some sense, he is a good person to chart the emergence of modernity in the Indian subcontinent. So he, he, he wears a number of hats, and to that I added the hat of a detective. So he is also, in my book, a detective. And a, a complex plot that uh, it is. So when did this journey start of coming up with this kind of a book? Well, you know, as readers, uh, I was just talking about it to Himak uh, outside. Uh, thank you, Himak, for introducing Krishna and uh, coordinating this. And uh, if I may be allowed a little authorial license. I also want to thank uh, uh, Bindu Yajusha and Guru Murthy Garu for having uh, come all the way here uh, to listen to the two of us. But uh, as uh, you know, as a reader, I always had an idea that I would like to write a novel. And a mystery novel is something that appeals to everybody. Uh, and the events. I began to get a lot of interest in Mirza Ghalib's life and how he, uh, you know, he became a poet. Uh, he had all kinds of personal quirks. I began reading about him, and I said, this would be a great character to uh, place in any particular novel. So that is the first thing. And the world of the Mushaira is a very interesting world. There are bunches of poets who show up and, you know, at any given point in time, not only recite their poetry, but engage in jousting and competition and literary, uh, you know, fights and there are intrigues. So, uh, so basically I thought to myself, what would happen if, uh, you know, one of the poets murdered another poet, you know, <laughs> so that, that is the kernel of the idea. But then, of course, if one of the poets murdered, then there's no mystery. So what if one of the poets was murdered and nobody knew what it was all about? Now, that's wonderful. Now we start the process. But what if the murder was linked to something really, uh, you know, uh, consequential in history? Uh, and so that began to, uh, you know, crystallize the, the, the fundamental line of the plot. And then, of course, if you want to write a novel, a novel is, after all, uh, involves a lot of socio-cultural commentary. And so I wanted to have different kinds of characters in that. 
So in my book, there are men and there are women. And uh, there are noble people and they are the poor agrarian class. Uh, there are Hindus and there are Muslims. There are Indians and there are British. And you know, the relationships between them, complex as they are, uh, I began to explore through various characters. Now, the final binary that I was incorporating was there are historical characters and fictional characters. So I incorporated a bunch of historical characters. I read the history. I tried to be as faithful to their character as I could be. But in order to flesh out the narrative, then I put in a lot of uh, characters that I invented with their personalities. And so the plot kept on emerging. It took me a long time, a few years, to write the book. Yeah. Having uh, uh, read this book, and I hope all of you uh, get a chance to read it, one thing that I loved was the attention to detail about Delhi in 1857. So for people who are interested, especially in history like me, I was intrigued by the level of detail that you could get to. So what was the source of this information about Delhi at that time? Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, India, uh, around the mid 19th century is extremely uh, well studied. So there's a lot of historical data. At this moment, I just want to, to have like a short digression and talk about Krishna's book. Now, as uh, Himak just mentioned in the introduction, uh, my friend Krishna has written a book called Viraya. Uh, Viraya is about one of his ancestors uh, who was transported into South Africa uh, as an indentured laborer. And through the story of Viraya, uh, Krishna excavates the experiences of a large number of people of Indian or origin who were indentured in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, for example, South Africa or Mauritius or Fiji or various uh, islands of the West Indies and so on and so forth. Uh, but what I did not know and I just learned by talking to Krishna is that the time period is roughly similar, the mid 19th century. So around 1857, I would imagine while all this intrigue was going on, uh, there were ships that were carrying these laborers to various parts of the world to work in, uh, you know, fields, uh, of cash crops. Anyway, to park that aside, and I cannot recommend this book strongly enough. Uh, it was very important to get the mahal, the atmosphere of any novel right. And so uh, I studied a lot of texts. I studied architecture. I studied music because there is some Kathak dancing in that. Uh, of course, uh, I studied the entire world of Urdu poetry and uh, being uh, relatively uh, familiar with the Urdu language, I was able to read a lot of Urdu books. Uh, one, uh, for example, I'll give you the example of one book. Uh, the book is called uh, Dilli Ki Akhri Shama by Farhatullah Beg. Uh, it's in Urdu and it basically describes a mushaira that happened in the 18th century. So how, how people would sit and how they would, uh, they would be a shama, they were, uh, a taper, a uh, lit candle, and it would be placed in front of the poet and the poet would declaim. And then people would either uh, shower effusive praise on them or you know, turn up their noses and then they would be riparty. All this very meticulously described what they, uh, you know, were wearing, what their mustaches looked like. This is a, so I, I got a lot of texture from that. But the world of the Mushaira in the 19th century, overwhelmingly male world. And to that extent, it's rather, you know, uh, one dimensional and boring. Uh, so then, you know, went back and found out a lot about the way the zanana, the, the female quarters, was organized and uh, how the women of that period uh, practiced uh, what 
turned out to be a surprising amount of agency in conducting their own affairs, uh, getting engaged with politics, and also, uh, you know, uh, in some sense, uh, I would say, playing an equal role in the 1857 revolt. So I was able to add texture to that. No, no, and it is very interesting to note that uh, you gave equal amount of importance to the characters, uh, whether it is uh, female characters or, or rather the female characters in this mystery as to how in the war of the uh, rebellion, you had women who were playing an equal, if not more important role. So that was an interesting part. And uh, uh, one rich texture to the whole book is about Urdu poetry. And uh, these are two of your uh, previous, uh, uh, this was the first book by Urza. It's called The Celebration of Progressive Urdu Poetry, The Anthems of Resistance. And its most recent book is uh, about Ghalib. So what I thought might help the audience if, is if you give us uh, an broad picture of Urdu poetry, the world of Urdu poetry. Well, Urdu is primarily, uh, you know, a language that has uh, remained in our consciousness through its poetry. Uh, Urdu emerged in the Indian landscape. It emerged around the 13th, 14th century. Uh, I would say Urdu is pretty much Hindi. Uh, you know, because it, its grammatical structure is completely derived from Hindi. Uh, it, uh, except that the vocabulary of Urdu was overlaid with uh, a lot of borrowings from different parts of the world and different parts of the subcontinent. So, for example, you will find Turkish words, you will find, uh, you know, words from the Central Asian uh, Central Asia region and a preponderance of Farsi which is Persian and then uh, from India you will see Pali uh, you will see a lot of uh, Maithili from the eastern uh, Gangetic seaboard and to some extent Gujarati and Marathi so it's kind of a nice little uh, khichdi of a language it does not have a relatively formalized grammatical structure जो लोग हिंदी जानते हैं उनको पता है कि मात्राएं कितनी इंपॉर्टेंट होती हैं मगर उर्दू में जो है ज़ेर ज़बर सब क्या बोलते हैं बहुत ही कभी रहता है कभी नहीं रहता है यू नो इट्स नॉट अ इट इज ए लैंग्वेज दैट इज मार्क्ड बाय अ प्रिपोंडरेंस ऑफ एन ओरल ट्रेडिशन एंड द ओरल ट्रेडिशन डेवलप्ड अ लॉट ऑफ रिदम सो यू स्टार्ट in the 13th century with people like Amir Khusro. He started writing the Ghazal. And then around the 15th, 16th century, you have Nazir Akbar Abadi, Sab Thaat Pada Reh Jaega, Jab Laad Chalega, Banjara. And then around the 18th century, the great Mir Taqi Mir comes in and he provides some of the famous rhyme schemes and the uh, uh, poetic structures that people like Ghalib even went with. And right till today, right till today, in the 20th and the 21st century, there's a lot, every single political movement, whether it is anti-colonial, whether it is socialist, whether it is globalist, whether it is feminist, all these traditions find their expression in Urdu poetry. But if I may say that uh, there is one poet that symbolizes Urdu poetry, it is Mirza Ghalib. Uh, we were lucky to have him for a long time, so he has a long corpus of poetry. So every one of these elements that I talked about finds expression in Ghalib's poetry. And so Urdu poetry, uh, as long as it is alive, I would imagine that Ghalib will be remembered. Lovely. At this point, I thought from the audience, if uh, you have a question for us about the book, okay. Uh, oh, um, yeah, I just have a question about the Ghalib language at local court was Persian, wasn't it? And so at what point did, was Urdu also spoken at the court? Or how did it? So, 
Thank you very much. That's a very important question. Uh, the, the formalized language of the Urdu court, wa, uh, sorry, the Mughal court was and remained Persian. That is all the tracts, all the court cases, everything was conducted in Persian, recorded in Persian and preserved in Persian, which is why the Persian of India has a uh, fairly easy tradition as far as, uh, uh, you know, historic, uh, uh, research is concerned. Urdu was the language of the streets. Urdu was the language of the streets and uh, the Mughal uh, court accepted it kicking and screaming is the only way to describe it. They would rather not deal with this. Uh, one of the words that was used to describe Urdu was rekta. Rekta means the fallen language. You know, if I may use the current language, it means kachra. So, but of course, like all uh, people who are uh, insulted, uh, it was appropriated. Now we proudly say, you know, rekta, one of the best Urdu sites is rekta.org. So, it emerged ironically as the Mughal court lost its influence, Urdu began to enter it. So what really happened was that the British, after they won the Battle of Plassey in 1757, began to expand eastward and, uh, sorry, uh, began to expand westward and southward. And slowly it reached a point they established their parallel administration, their parallel courts, and there they began to conduct their activities in English. So the Mughal court became nominal. The Mughal court became symbolic. At that point in time, they began to adopt Urdu. And what happened by the time, say, uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar, who's the last uh, Mughal king, when he was there, uh, the court, basically the British gave them a stipend and said, spend it whichever way you want. So they then began to do these mushairas and stuff like that. So this really, you know, it never was an official language, either of the Mughals or of the British, but it was the language of the street and became popular every day. Since you have done a lot of research on 1857, the first war of independence, I just wanted to know that geographically, you know, like you had you had this war simulating in Delhi, and then another place in Baksar. So, so if there was not a continuation, you know, like generally you would have it in Delhi and then around Delhi, and so it was in Baksar, Meera, and so why is such any research on that? And why is such sporadic places where? You know, so that is uh, the more uh, sort of to reframe your question, if it, if there was a spark, how did it catch fire so fast? So if you may chart the prehistory of 1857, uh, so Mangal Pandey, a soldier, was killed by the British in January of 18, uh, or was it in 1856? No, 1857. Uh, now, the, the revolt was slow in the making, but it was, it was a very popular revolt. It was popular at the level of peasantry because the taxation regimes were becoming brutal. People were starving. The, the, the harvest would be plentiful, but there was no food to eat because all of it was taken away. Uh, you know, ships took it away. So people were starving. That's point number one. Point number two is that it was popular at the level of nobility because the British administration enacted what is called the doctrine of lapse and basically said if anybody, you know, basically they found excuses to take over princely states. So the most notable one was Jhansi in 1854 where the Lakshmi Bai's, uh, uh, you know, son was not recognized. And 1856 in Awadh when Wajir Ali Shah was deposed. So the nobility, it was popular. The thing was that who will, who will revolt? In order to revolt, you need to have some arms. So this revolt really began in the barracks. That's why the British used to call it the Sepoy Mutiny. 
but it began in the barracks. And so essentially, uh, it starts off in Bengal. And just think of the Ganga Ulti Bhari. So it goes this way. And you know, there is stuff that's going on in Banaras, uh, Baksar. Baksar is western. Then it comes to the eastern side, uh, uh, Allahabad, Banaras. But the major flashpoint is Meerut. So the Meerut rebels who were, I mean, it's all about the gun. Let me also, many of you know this, but I just want to say that the British government introduced a new gun, the Enfield 357, where uh, you are supposed to bite down on the cartridge before you uh, load it. And the, the, the rumor was that it, wa it had pig fat and uh, pork fat in it. Uh, sorry, pig fat and cow tallow in that. So, so both the Hindus and Muslims were outraged and said, we won't bite. And the British said, if you don't, we will court martial the lot of you. They, they disastrously misread. So these guys who had the weapons, they just killed their officers and they went to the went to Delhi and they took over. The moment that happened, the entire, uh, at least the Indo-Gangetic seaboard fell in line and that's why the revolt. So it was fast in the making, but slow in the churn. That's my reading of it. One of the artifacts uh, that we learned from Urdu's revolution is that when British learned a little bit of Urdu, they didn't like the girl at all. They say Razal is something that makes people hallucinate because the metaphors we use in Gal, Shama Parvana, and, and all those things, these are imaginary stuffs. So they made an effort, actually, when the education department was set up in Lahore, the director of that department was a British man. He used Hali and Mahmoud Sahibazar, who had migrated from Delhi, to you know, start translating Tanisan start translating words because that's what, <laughs> what is worth learning. Your color is useless. So they actually held a mushara in the hall where words are required to only read a nazal. You cannot, you could not recite a nazal. But these people did not understand that nazal was not only a form of poetry. It was something which was part of the soul of people. It was part of the culture. So they didn't, uh, actually appreciate that, and Gadab did not know it, continued. I couldn't agree more, and I couldn't have put it better myself. They called it natural poetry, nun chim re lam. You know, uh, that word became an Urdu word, natural poetry. They wanted you to write about waterfalls and rainbows, but they, they never understood the ghazal, and everybody thought that the ghazal would die. Even the progressive thought the ghazal would die. But here it, we are in the 21st century, and the dominant form of Urdu poetry remains the Ghazal. Do, do you think that uh, the um, people, people like me who grew up in, in a place like Agra, where we had a lot of Urdu-speaking people all around us, but since I was a Hindu, I was reading Hindi books, and I could not read Urdu books. Yeah. And, and I think that that was a major source of division, cultural division, because the material that the Hindi books picked up about culture and the material that the Urdu books picked up about culture is just totally different. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I understand that perfectly. I understand that perfectly. Even now, till now, you know, there is this notion of what is Hindi and what is Urdu and uh, things like that. Uh, but the reality is that 90% of the language is the same. But you are absolutely right that the, if, we, if we are to use the, you know, the font, the, the Devanagari font, Devanagari font mein jo hai, Sanskriti ki baat hoti thi, aur uh, Nastali font mein tehzeeb o tamaddun ki baat hoti thi. It was all the same, but you know, when you use words like Sanskriti versus tehzeeb, uh, suddenly, you know, it imparts, uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it is very important to punch holes through these divisions and realize 
that they are one and the same thing. And nowadays in the world of WhatsApp, people uh, write <laughs> Roman anyway, so it seems to work quite well. Uh, I have actually a follow-up question for you. Um, you know, Raja Ramavan Roy Ji. wrote in Persian. Yeah. So some of his material is in Persian. And um, if that tradition had continued, we would probably not have the division between the two countries. Yeah. But uh, do you think that it was Mr. Mahalaya's doing that, that the educational system was designed the way it was designed? Well, certainly uh, that was a major part of it, right? That was a major part of it. And it happened in the post-1857 time, uh, as you said. What's your name? Pramod Rawat. As Pramod Saab said, uh, uh, Ram Mohan Roy studied in a madrasa, wrote in Farsi, and uh, that wasn't particularly remarkable for its time. All of us have probably parents or grandparents or relatives who did something similar. Uh, it was very difficult to govern the country, to be that unpopular as the British were in 1858 or 1859 and still govern the country. So it is quite natural for them to exploit certain existing divisions in that. And also, I mean, what's your name? Surinder. Surinder. Surinder sahab bata rahe the ke, you know, the natural, you know, why don't you work with the romantics and uh, Coleridge and Wordsworth and so on and so forth. Uh, that was also part of it, trying to produce continuities where there were perhaps few of them and produce divisions where there were none. So uh, this was a process that, that happened. I'm not one, I, I'm not one to, to put causality directly, but it had a very important role. That's all I'll say. And there's a couple of your favorite poems for the audience, please. Oh, uh, no, I, I think that uh, uh, I'll just uh, recite a couple of uh, uh, lines, some of the poems that I have used uh, in this ke ghame hasti ka asad you know ghalib had i mean as you all know uh, that poems ghazals end with a maqta and the maqta is the last two lines of the poem typically where the poet signs his name into the verse and ghalib had two taqalluses one was uh, ghalib and the other was asad which was his shortening of his name, Asadullah Khan. Ke ghame hasti ka asad, kis se ho juz marg ilaj. That is, what is the cure for the ills of life except death, dear Asad? Ghame hasti ka asad, kis se ho juz marg ilaj. Shamma har rang mein jalti hai, seher hone tak. The taper burns. You know, this is what life is, you know. We, we, we live, we are doomed to live, we are condemned to live till we die. And the, the, the grief of the heart uh, can only be cured by death. Uh, this is a ex especially, uh, you know, sorrowful poem, but you know, Ghalib has other lines which are a lot uh, optimistic as well. Uh, one more question. Yes. Both of you. Uh, Krishna, how would you describe the style of writing? And Raza, how would you, uh, for that style of writing, what influenced you and what gave you the inspiration to do it? Okay. That style. So the question is first for you. How would no, you no, I, I think I'll give it to Raza first. <laughs> Can I just? But for a second to, <laughs> to my friend Krishna's book again, <laughs> because I think that this is a very important uh, uh, socio-economic, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, social document uh, about uh, a relatively well -known, uh, less known aspect of Indian history. Uh, you know, folks, just to, to, to sort of connect it to the contemporary world, uh, the Qatar, uh, the World Cup happened in Qatar. Right, and uh, it was deemed to be a huge success. 
but really the 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 sort of labor that was used to uh, to build those stadiums and the number of people who actually died during the uh, you know construction of those stadiums is rather shameful and uh, you know so to connect it to that they were indentured laborers they were economic refugees who ended up there and were massively exploited and so likewise the history of india has this if i may say rather shameful chapter where during the uh, 19th century large numbers of them working in sugarcane fields in cotton fields uh, in basically not really uh, food crops but cash crops were taken away uh, now krishna in this book uh, what is really good is it's not an academic book but it's really some sort of a testimonial because he found out and the manner in which he found out that one of his relatives was uh, you know possibly indentured and the way he drilled down and excavated that and turned it into the narrative of a single individual called Viraya who is his ancestor uh, is quite quite remarkable i would recommend that uh, so sometimes uh, the ability to turn non fiction into narrative that's like that is something worth exploring so i'll leave it at that thank you sir and while uh, writing a book like this uh, it takes uh, a lot of oneself but uh, having been through a similar journey where you are trying to write about a complex uh, piece of say history you are trying to create some fiction uh, there is uh, an element of support that has to happen in your ecosystem so from the family who would you like to thank for your book from my from my family well you know uh, I, I i inflicted everything upon them one i have a son who was 9 years old he said well if it's a mystery don't make it obvious now <laughs> you might think that that is not but i i thought it was very good ke thode characters hona chahiye all of them should have potential <laughs> motives and uh, you know and when the the murderer is revealed it shouldn't be like oh damn it i never thought of this person oh so it is this person and so i had to throw in a lot of red herrings and uh, you know uh, long suffering uh, partners are always uh, you know should i say used so my wife got to hear a lot of it and she got to uh, edit a lot of it without really uh, wanting to and then my brother and my sister and friends like but you know the book stayed with me for a very long time and it was predicated my ability to write this book uh, to finish this book was predicated on my ability to find a voice for this character so it's not about ghalib the great poet ghalib the great poet exists but he is also in his domestic space uh, his wife uh, like all wives uh, has a low opinion of him she doesn't really <laughs> I mean isn't that true that you know you might be the poet laureate but at home i really know you so uh these little nuances i had to work out and then there are several relationships in the book you know uh friends friendship between men you know romantic relationships relationships across class and caste lines religious lines so on and so forth and in that how people talk to each other those are some of the important things that uh, you know took a long time fleshing out and to reflect upon what you were saying to, to me uh, my book is about the search for my ancestor that is my father who is sitting here his grandfather so i learn as a 9 year old that your ancestor went to south africa but i can't figure out why so when i'm a teenager i hear this word called indenture and then i start learning that you're from india you had 1.3 million indians 1.3 million indians were shipped off as sugarcane coolies so this happens between 1847 and 1917 to south africa guyana west indies fiji and so on and then i know that now my ancestor was a sugarcane coolie but to find but my uh, uh, life's goal became to find him i wanted to know who he was 
So that journey took about 25 years. So it was, I was close to, I think, 45 when I found his ship record. And then I realized that very few people have heard this story. So the story is not about my ancestor, but of these millions of Indians. So I wrote the book. So that journey took about, uh, about four years to write the book. And uh, uh, now when I reflect back, as you were saying, uh, some people pay uh, a greater price than me. You know, I, was, uh, I went insane trying to search for my roots and writing. But my wife who is here and my daughter who is here, uh, yeah, Bindu and Yajusha, thank you, because they paid with their time. So during this long hours of my search and long hours of writing this book, uh, as you would agree, you are transported to a different world. So you are not uh, here while you are uh, putting this thing together. So thanks to them. Uh, yeah. So, so, I have a question now. I have yeah. not read the novel, but the way you describe it, it would be categorized as a historical yeah. novel. So, if we are writing a contemporary story, it's very easy because we know how people behave, yeah. how they are, what they eat, how they get the information. But when we go back in time, 150 years, you know, the world was very different. Of course, you can read from history books, whatever is written there. So I'm just asking your own experience. How did you physically or mentally transported yourself to that world of Delhi, which you describe in your book, and covered the social interaction and uh, what people were talking, the way they were thinking, processing information? So if you could briefly just uh, sum up that. Jeep, uh, like I said, I started with Ghalib's letters. So Ghalib really talks about mundane things about, you know, uh, this happened and that happened. He wanted to go, for example, uh, from uh, uh, Delhi to Agra. How do you go? Well, they, they went by uh, river boat. And you can go by river boat all the way from uh, Delhi to Calcutta. You know, you just uh, go down the Jamuna and you take a dog leg at uh, Allahabad uh, and you are on the Ganga. So that, and then you have the architecture. So ghar aisa hota tha. Uh, you know, there was the female quarters and the male quarters. Now, uh, for example, uh, a lot of, I mean, I read a lot of literature of the Shia community. In the Shia community, they have this majalis and uh, uh, so they describe uh, how they, you know, do the farsh and uh, how they, uh, you know, communicate across the chilman, which is the separation between the male and the female quarters. Uh, there's a lot of stuff for, on the economic record about how much tax was paid and, you know, how it was collected. And from the court records, you have things like, you know, what sort of... Uh, regimes of uh, crime and punishment were there. So you can get a lot of it. The trick is not to write it as non-fiction. You can't say okay, he walked in and the Dalan was square and this, there was this. You have to somehow or the other build it into the narrative so that it does not become boring. Uh, uh, what's your name, sir? So what Shubhajit was asking, how did the take on this character, I kind of figured out and I developed some sort of uh, an understanding, uh, but it had to be communicated through the experience of some of those characters. Uh, so why, how they were angry, and I don't want to give much of the plot away, but transporting the, uh, the message of the revolt across the uh, Indian uh, subcontinent, uh, left to right, uh, west to east, uh, forms part of the narrative. And I don't know first, oh, so what's your name? Shubhajit. Shubhajit. Huh? No, no, no. Uh, Parveen. What uh, Parveen was asking, uh, uh, the court records of uh, Persian are not available to me because I don't read Persian, I do read Urdu. Uh, so I uh, went and, uh, so th there is some, William Dalrymple's book, uh, The Last Mughal had some, and Mahmoud Farooqi's book, uh, 
uh, the, this one book which uh, I've forgotten its name right now, which had some of that. So you collect it all, but wo kahani mein hona it cannot be the, the narrative cannot be interrupted by your descriptions. And so just to add, so my source, the story, the source for me was my grandmother. So I keep telling kids that, you know, if you have your grandparents, you should spend time with them. Because the stories that they can tell, once they're gone, the stories are gone. So it was my grandmother's narrative as to how was life in 1920s, 30s, how was Vijayawada, or, you know, how would she react to her husband. So a lot of that uh, formed the context for my book. So to me, elders are a big source of uh, information and stories. Sure. And uh, to add to that, uh, Krishna seems to have begun his narrative after his grandmother passed away. So she was no longer there, but uh, the memory of what she told him uh, was, kept, was something that kept igniting him. Yeah. As, you, as you look at the past in your books, I suppose there are times when you think about the future. Yes. And, uh, you know, I left India in 1958. And at that time, there was a spirit that the countries were becoming free, and uh, there was, uh, you, you know, you could fly everywhere, and the young youngsters from Africa were coming to Germany to study, and so on and so forth. And there was, there was a sense of hope. The European Union was just beginning to bubble up. Uh, they were beginning to abandon their um, um, their ancient wars and fights, and now, you know, fast forward, look at the world now, and look just absolutely terrible. No matter where you look, there is there is the potential for a catastrophe. Do you think about this? Well, let me confine myself to the book. Uh, you are absolutely <laughs> right that you know things are very bleak, but. Uh, uh, Somebody, uh, my publisher had asked me, okay, how do you make sense of what was happening in Delhi at that point in time? Because there is a sense of disquiet. There's something terrible is afoot. Something horrible is going to happen. And I went and I read accounts of Germany in the 1930s, you know, before the Third Reich really, you know, began, the, before the invasion of Poland. And you see in that, uh, you know, the mistreatment of the Jews has begun. The police state is going after civil rights. Anybody who talks about press freedom and so on and so forth is being attacked. And so it really gave me a good sense of what 1857, early 1857 Delhi might have been like. And you know, you are absolutely right, past is prologue. Past is prologue in the sense that what happened then uh, may well happen now. Uh, recently, I was reading a book uh, called uh, Half of a Yellow Sun about, by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie about the Biafran War in Nigeria. I can't tell you how similar it is. The, the, the cracking of the post-colonial state, you know, existing divisions and new divisions that were there is all, you know, pretty much there. And, you know, like you said, Europe, Europe is like this, right? They, they fight each other like uh, in the worst way. And then there are periods of mellow peace. So uh, let us hope that uh, in, you know, South Asia also uh, an era of mellow peace is around the corner. That's all we can do, right? We can hope. <laughs> My question is about your process of writing this book. Uh, thank you. You said that uh, it arose out of a question that what if a poet is killed? So I want to know with, uh, if you knew everything that was going to happen in the book before you wrote it, or were you like a detective while you were writing it, exploring and so sort of finding out what would happen next? Who did what? You know, it, 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 it is a large, a large part of it was the second part, and I was quite surprised. I was quite surprised. I had decided that certain characters would go in a certain direction, but when you start writing them, it feels, 
as an author, it feels that they start telling you, no, 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 I'm not like that. Uh, <laughs> you know, you haven't understood this aspect of me and you haven't, so we, I mean, I knew the basic outline. I knew who did it and I knew <laughs> why they did it. But how it unfolded and a lot of minor characters and how it went about, uh, it changed. And not to, I mean, also the editorial process was a little interesting for me. Uh, my editor uh, was quite hands-on and said, no, 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 I don't understand this. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And this is too much exposition. And so a little bit of explaining to them made some parts of it come alive. But uh, I was very surprised. I was very surprised. What's your name? Sonal. Sonal. Sonal, I was so surprised that uh, I had to change parts of it because it, <laughs> it appeared that the characters wouldn't let me proceed and, until I changed that. So there is a character in my book called Ratna. And I, Ratna particularly, you know, yelled at me a few times and made me change her character. So I remember that. I just remembered it when you told me. Thank you. And sort of one, one more uh, tip is, say, maybe uh, in the early stages of writing a book like this, it always helps to have somebody who you can look up to, right? Because you can take feedback, but most of the time, if people give you feedback saying, you know, if this is not looking good, you might not uh, take it seriously, right? So you got to get be lucky to hand over you know, your life's work or uh, something that you're very, very passionate to somebody and when they give you feedback, you should be able to receive it as well. So on that count, I got very lucky because the first, for the first, the, I gave Tatu the whole book and he looks at it and when he said, you know, okay, in the, in the first chapter, you know, the way you are searching, maybe you got to write a lot more. So then I said, oh, okay, so it makes sense. So in my mind, getting that sounding board early in the, Book writing journey, that helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah, Pabir. Um, I have a question about speaking of like hope, being hopeful for the future. Um, I read the New York Times recently that there's a lot of um, young people interested in Delhi with these like uh, poetry recitation, like Mushaira, um, you know, reviving this tradition. It seemed like a lot of the um, attendees were 20s, 30s, and they were. They appear to be Muslim. I'm just wondering whether there's any kind of permeation into Hindu culture, uh, you know, at, or, you know, given how polarized, it, at least from here, it appears that I was, you know, not to be to generalize in two months, but there's like a lot of international. Is there any way that poetry could provide some kind of bridge? And how much reading are Hindus of doing of Hindu culture? Yes. Uh, my experience, my lived experience, is that uh, it has always been there very deeply. When you start in any gathering reciting poetry, particularly Urdu poetry, I mean, it, it does something. It does something. It provides a certain kind of joy uh, to Hindus and Muslims alike, particularly those who are Hindi speakers. And so I feel that I feel that those who are trying to use particularly language and religion to divide, uh, I mean, it may appear that they are hegemonic right now. It may appear that they are ascendant right now. But, but I think that still that thing remains. Uh, the, the most important thing I feel, Parveen, is that you, I mean, in, in places like India and Pakistan and also in diasporic spaces is to provide the institutional spaces where these people mingle. Because in the world of particularly social media dominated uh, techscapes, uh, it is very easy to go through a day without meeting the other. But when you meet the other, it is really difficult to fight with them. Because you realize, ye to sab same hai, you know, uh, and I can say that from both sides. So let us hope. But, but those spaces, uh, really, we really have to figure out innovative ways to have to produce those meetings. Yeah.
question. One more question. Last question. Uh, this will be the last question. Uh, Shahzad is my name. Uh, I have a question like... Uh, Ji, sorry? Shahzad. Sure. Uh, is, 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 will the official language Persian bring the Mughal Empire? And uh, are there records of like 1857 from the, the you know, perspective of, you know, um, or are there records in India and Delhi of, you know, like, was it like a newspaper that had like a or something? that you can gather information about what they, what their perspective? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, there was something called Delhi Urdu Akbar, uh, and that was there. Uh, there are three phases, right? One is pre-1857. Uh, one is that short period when Delhi was ruled by the rebels, and then the post-1857. Post-1857, the British censorship was very strong, but Ghalib wrote a book in Farsi. It's called Das Tambu. Uh, I have read the Urdu version of it. I don't read uh, Farsi. Uh, there is Zahir Dahelvi who had written something called dastan e ghadar which is full of, uh, full of stuff. Uh, but really what you see is that marked difference that during the time the rebels controlled Delhi, the narrative is really, you know, pro-rebels. And then after that, you know, it becomes, it never is anti-rebel because after all these people are, the anti-rebel narrative is awash in the English language. You know, the darkies, so to speak. Uh, forget that. But the, the Urdu and Farsi uh, accounts, particularly the Farsi accounts, are very, kya bolte, mubham. Uh, they were a little veiled, a little uh, ambiguous. But they had that element of resistance in them. And Ghalib's work in Dastambu is a particular exemplar of that.